Hello everyone, I'm Alex. As previously mentioned, I'm actually a master's candidate at Nicholas Provost Lab, the Bar Lab, and I want to sh show you guys what I'm currently working on as my master's thesis. It's called Gaia, the General Rabbit Office Intelligent Agent. The ideal of Gaia is to, to create a web tool that aggregates and synthesizes information across many different databases and tools and use it for plant biology to be able to easily and accessibly answer questions that researchers may have on the topic. A quick way to think about what Gaia is is very similar to like Google Assistant, Siri or Cortana or Alexa, where you ask a question and it presents using a knowledge graph and, and a respective, uh, hopefully an accessible way to answer uh, answer that question. So like a visual example is that when you go on Google and search up, when was the French Revolution started? You'll come back with a direct answer and some possible related information for you to look in de more depth to it. Now we want to create this for biology. Now for some aspects of Google or the search engines, you can already access for like functions of a gene. But when it comes to asking, like, I want to find sub cell tissue localization, or you want to find more in detail things like that, or protein network interactions, Google mostly gives sends you to other databases or other tools, or maybe you yourself have to siphon through or parse through a bunch of publications. So we want to create a tool that does this for you. And that's the whole point of Gaia. And Gaia actually works on two fundamental aspects. We use natural language processing, or NLP, to understand and answer a question and then we use data aggregation or data collection to be able to accumulate this information to answer that question. And that's what I'm gonna go over mostly about how Gaia works and I should present a bit of what Gaia is. So the NLP or the natural language processing, we use existing models that exist out, uh, are publicly available right now for free. And we use this to scientifically answer some questions. So we have three aspects of NLP that we use. We have name entity recognition or NER, we have aspect mining and we have text summarization. So I'm gonna go through each of those steps and hopefully I can answer that in a, in a clear way. A clear way. If you have any questions, I'm glad to answer at any point. So the first aspect is name entity rec recognition. So this is the idea of like when you have a query or a question, it breaks it down and understand what is inside of it and how it can answer, uh, how it can be uh, contextualized. So let's say you have a query and the query is ABI3. The first thing we look at before we even start doing a NER is we see, is there any exact matches to an existing locus or gene or gene product? And is there an exact match to an existing bar tool or a combination of those two? So let's say there was the query was just ABI3. This is an exact match to an existing query. And from there, we actually present a general output page or what we call a dump output page, which presents all the information for the gene that we have available and makes it a, an easy navigatable user interface. Now let's say it also includes a bar tool like ePlant or EFE Seek Browser. Then we start redirecting it towards that. And if we add a query to that, like a gene product to e, the bar tool, it will actually re respectively redirect to that as well. Now, when it comes to actually answering questions, so let's say the question is, what is the function of ABI3 or ABI3 function? We use uh, is this an uh, NLP called compromise, which allows us to do part of speech tag and it break down a sentence and be able to determine what each word is. So if a word is a noun or a verb, and then if a word is a noun, which most genes or gene products are, as there's no scientific corpus to understand what each word is. So in that case, most genes or gene products are nouns. In that case, we look at those nouns and compare it against a, a database of aliases. And from there, if it, there's a match, we assume that is a gene or gene product. In the case that it does not match, or in the case that's a non copular verb, we actually look at determine whether those words, if they're a non copular verb or a noun that's not in a database, and determine that as a function of focus words. Now, this works for both for uh, a proper and improper question. So an improper question is like ABI3 function, but what people typically Google. And a proper question is like, what is the function of ABI3 including proper grammar? Now this also works for synonymous words. So let's say the word function and role is synonymous. Our current uh, logic allows you to go through and understand what words, uh, synonymous words can be used to answer the same questions. And this is actually part of aspect mining how we do this. So in aspect mining, we actually look at the focus word and from the, the example given before, ABI3 function, we retrieve all the data we have. So from the existing databases to others, at other re reprocessing, to be able to determine all the available products for the gene. From there, we convert the focus word into different phrases, past tense, present tense, future tense, as well as singular, plural, and all synonymous words to allow to find uh, all the words that might be able to find for, for the aspect mining. From there, we do partial or full matches, determine what each 
uh, focus where it can be within uh, the database using keys and values of a dictionary or the database and determine what the possible gene data is. And from there, in this case, you got a uh, function uh, and the focus for this function inside the, the database, you have a, a exact key match of function to present the data. And this can be allowed for other things as well. So let's say you want description or you want subcellular tissue, lo sub tissue localization that can also be presented here. That's how we use NLP to answer questions, but we also use existing uh, NLP modules for text summarization. So let's say you ask a question about a publication or in our executive summary for a general output, we actually summarize publications for the user. We actually use Node Summarizer, which is a frequency-based and text rank based algorithm, which uses uh, context process, process context and sentiment analysis to understand what's inside of a body of text. In other words, it looks for like the most important part of a sentence. Of, of a body of text and then presents that or modifies that. Now, this typically works for most abstracts. It's not always perfect as pres example presented here, but we use this to be able to eat quickly and assess quickly summarize and display abstracts for a user based on their results or what they ask. Now, none of this work without any proper data collection or data aggregation. So we actually have a lot of data processing going on. So we uh, take, re we pro collect and process results from the variety of different tools, including BAR, NCBI, as well as other sources, and be able to present that information and accumulate, accumulate it in a very simple and easy to read. So in the BAR alone, we have a bunch of gene summarization, gene structures, a uh, bunch of tissue expression and protein data, as well as more, which we're actually re reprocessing and be able to present it to the user in a very simple and human readable format. From NCBI, we actually retrieve gene data. So in this case, when it comes to like live and uh, discontinued uh, genes, genes, we actually include that within Gaia. So let's say you want to look at a publication from a long time ago that uses discontinued gene alias or discontinued gene data, we can still search that off the Gaia and find what might be synonymous to that in current day. And we also look at publications. So in publications, we have used NCBI's entries and eSearch to be able to determine uh, what publications are available based on your query and as well as search against all aliases for that uh, gene. And from there, we actually be able to process that and present that to the user. But unfortunately, NCBS Entrez, at least the public version, doesn't allow to retrieve all the details. So we actually use Semantic Scholar to retrieve citations, where it's been cited by, who it's been cited by, and the influence count. And then we also web scrape through NCBS website to find figures. Now, this is what we currently have that's been used to answer questions for the NLP and Gaia. But we plan to actually retrieve more data from more processing of data from the bar. We actually plan to retrieve uh, gene reference geo and SRA data. So those two are what we're currently doing right now. And if time permits, we actually want to add like commercial products. So like on a gene card, you can search a gene, uh, a gene product and find out what antibodies or what assays are available. We plan to incorporate this for your gene product for the species of interest. And we also plan to go through web, Google, Google uh, patent, web scrape through Google patents. So you can see what like private products have already been created or private interests have been done for that in case you have any interest for your own products. If we go back to the idea of the figures web scraping, we are actually working with a team at UOIT, Ontario Tech University. And they're actually working on creating a visual image recognition machine learning algorithm, which contextualize scientific models and find relationship between the words and within the models. And if you see how the first thing what it does is that like, we have two here, two figures. So the left figure is like, it first determines when you give it a figure, what is a gene model, a, a, a scientific model and what is not. If it determines that a uh, figure is a model, it will then use this visual image recognition to go through that and determine what is the context or relationship between text and uh, the arrows or objects within an image. And that allows them to understand what, uh, let's say you want to search what GID, GID1 is and it's related to other gene products. Using GeneNet, they can actually create a database and determine that's related to GA3 application and, other, and uh, GA response. Now we actually, they actually plan to create a database for the classifications. And with Gidden Gaia, we plan to search through this, their REST API, determine uh, what can be possibly related and what genes may be a, a, a relationship to one another. So an example of how we're doing this, we currently have a few undergrads working on like a related gene factor. So when you search up a gene uh, on Gaia, it would actually suggest you other genes to look at, it might be a relationship based on protein-protein interactions, publication, uh, publication references, and uh, go overlap. And we plan to combine this with GeneNet to allow us to suggest a possibly other related genes. Or if you, 
one feature that Gaia will be having very soon would be the idea of a search of multiple genes and compare their data. So in this case, let's say you search up uh, two different genes and they're both found in the same publication figure through GeneNet, we can actually suggest and display this to figure towards the user and allow them to go through the publication themselves. Just a bit of background on how GeneNet works. Uh, GeneNet is a three-batch input conventional neural net, uh, using conventional neural, neural networks, and it uses uh, a triple map net, triple network, a tiplet network, to be able to understand how the uh, how these images are mapped, and it has an accuracy of about eighty point six percent. So I, so this is how they've done it, um, and. All this, all, everything I presented to you won't matter unless we actually have a very accessible way to present this data. So we actually creating a, a, a accessible user interface and user experience based off Google material design. And this allows us to use it to go through it very, uh, very easily without any need of tutorials or any lessons being learned. So let's say you just search something from Gaia, it will actually present, we hope to make the user interface very uh, easy to navigate and very intuitive. So we have the executive summary at the top which would be presented in the green box. And obviously that's where your answers to questions would go. And from there, we'll have a dump of data. So at the current moment, it dumps all relevant data. But what we have with some current development is that we're actually having contextualized loading. So let's say you ask a question about gene structure. We're only going to display data that's re relevant to the gene structure itself and everything else can be toggleable. That's not all we have planned in UI. UI is kind of a, a one of the last aspects of Gaia we're working on, but we actually plan to have executive summary or the answer to the questions to be actually retrievable via an API or web server so other developers can then uh, use that information or use that tool to their own, their own means. We plan to create a TLDR version of executive summary, so like a jot note format. And we actually have, plan to have account features very similar to EFP Seek browser, which includes like search history theme, and theme customization. So Gaia will soon be publicly available around uh, first or second week of May, and we can have, if you guys were interested, it'll be actually at, uh, the, at the, uh, one of the links I'll show up at the end of the slides when I'm answering questions. So I realized I talked really too fast. I'm so sorry, and thank you for your time. <laughs>